Whether you kill a man in a duel or stab him in the back, the charge against you is the same these days, the charge of murder. The murderer may escape scot-free, the slain man may have deserved death a thousand times, yet the effect upon his family can only be regarded as disastrous, whatever the circumstances. This I was to discover for myself in the spring of 1858, when I was holidaying in Italy. Mr. Fortune? It is Mr. Fortune, isn't it? Miss Elmsley, good heavens, what brings you to Naples? My mother and I are here as guests of Mr. Monkton. Alfred, he's here too. But this is a most delightful surprise. Well, I hope you'll be my guest for dinner as soon as possible. Oh, well... What's the matter? You seem troubled. May I join you for a moment? Yes, of course. Please, sit down. Uh, how pretty the gardens are this time of year. I don't believe it's the gardens you wish to discuss. How well do you know Alfred, sir? <laughs> We're neither bosom friends nor distant acquaintances, ma'am, but something in between. Why? But he knows you well and trusts you, I believe. I hope so. Oh, Mr Fortune, if ever Alfred needed the help and advice of a friend, that moment is now. Is he in some kind of trouble? Let me tell you, in the strictest confidence, that Alfred is dying. What? Well, slowly, to be sure, and of no physical malady. But he is dying. And unless he receives help, and quickly, I believe he will be dead long before we can return to England. When Ada told me she'd met you at the Villa Reale Piers, I scarcely believed her at first. <laughs> Such a coincidence. What are you doing in Naples? The last time we met was at Wincott Abbey. Yes, indeed. Well, your Uncle Stephen was visiting at the time, I recall. Uncle Stephen. You met him then? <laughs> yes, of course you did. And if you'll forgive me, he was not a man I should greatly wish to meet a second time. There's no likelihood of that. Not in this world. What's the matter? What's caught your attention? What? What are you staring at so oddly? Nothing. Nothing at all. Um, Piers, would you object to sitting in a stronger light? Of course not. But isn't the reading lamp sufficient? I must have more light. As you please. I don't mind. Would you help me to light some candles? My hands... I find it difficult to stop them from trembling. What's wrong? Well, just light the candles, will you? Do I gather from what you said just now that your Uncle Stephen has died? His death is the sole reason for my being in Naples. Oh, really? You recognised at your one meeting with Stephen Monkton that he was uh, an unpleasant man? If I'm to be honest, I must confess, I found him... I'm sorry, but I found him depraved. <laughs> depraved. I can think of no word more apt to describe him, yet... I need him. Now that he's dead, I need him. Look, I can see you mean it, but I don't begin to understand you. I mean, why should you need him now when you clearly despised him during his lifetime? Oh, Piers. There's so much to tell you that... So much that is bizarre and terrifying. I, I scarcely know where to begin. Well, then tell me first about your uncle. Very well, then. <laughs> Since I'm already known as Mad Monkton to almost everyone in Naples, I may as well appear mad to you also. You don't appear in the least mad to me, but you do look distressed and unwell. There's a legend connected with Wincott Abbey and the Monkton family. I should like you to read before I proceed any further. Thank you. Uh, this is your handwriting, is it not? I copied it from the original, written on the blank leaf of the Abbey manuscript. But the legend existed long before that verse came to be written. When in Wincott Vault a place waits for one of Monkton's race, when that one forlorn shall lie graveless under open sky, beggared of six feet of earth, though lord of acres from his birth, that shall be a certain sign of the end of Monkton's line, dwindling ever faster, faster, dwindling to the last left master, from mortal ken, from light of day, 
Moncton's race shall pass away. <sighs> now, I'd call this superior doggerel and nothing else. Doggerel or not, it is being accomplished. I am now the last left master. The last of that elder line of the family at which the prediction points. And the corpse of Stephen Moncton is not in the vaults of Wincott Abbey. Oh, but you surely can't take this nonsense seriously. My family has taken it seriously for the last 500 years. Every one of the Monctons was buried in Wincott Vault, no matter at what risk or sacrifice. For centuries, the succession of the dead in that vault has been unbroken, absolutely unbroken. Until now. The place mentioned in the prediction as waiting to be filled is Stephen Monckton's place. The voice that cries vainly to the earth for shelter is the voice of the dead. You don't believe me, do you? But I swear to you it's true. I swear this because Stephen Monckton stands behind you at this moment, confirming me in my belief. I see. There. The figure of a dark-complexioned man standing up with his head uncovered, one of his hands still clutching a pistol, has fallen to his side. The other presses a bloody handkerchief to his mouth. The spasm of mortal agony convulses his features, plainly, as if he stood there living. I see him now at your side, with the death glare in his great black eyes. And thus I have seen him ever since the moment of his death, at home and abroad, waking or sleeping day and night, we're always together, wherever I go. I promise you, Miss Elmsley, I was never more frightened in my life than I was in that room of Alfred's. His belief in the presence of his uncle was so real that I too felt it. Then, and for several hours more. But what happened afterwards? Oh, it seems that Alfred has not told you the whole story yet. Well, his description of the prophecy, that wretched poem, had so exhausted him that I realised it might actually impair his health were he to continue the narrative. So I summoned his man. Together we persuaded Alfred to retire for the night. I supervised his taking of a little laudanum, enough to assure him of a good night's sleep, then I left. So you are still unaware of the peculiar circumstances of Stephen Monckton's death? I am indeed. But do they have any relevance to the prophecy? An extreme relevance. Alfred feels he cannot marry me until his uncle is interred in the vault, thereby assuring the continuance of the Monckton line. Well, to inter Stephen Monckton's body, it must first be found. And though Alfred has searched everywhere for three months now, he cannot discover it. But why should it be so appallingly difficult to find Moncton? He was murdered. In some respects, one might say legally, but he was murdered. Somewhere between Naples and Rome on February 22nd of this year. What happened, Piers, was this. It seems that my uncle and some equally unscrupulous Frenchman, the Count saint Lô, fell out over a gambling debt. Stephen Monckton challenged saint Lô to a duel, and it was to be a duel to the death. They were on Italian soil at the time, Mr Fortune, and both the Pope and the Neapolitan authorities had recently forbidden dueling. Well, certainly, as far as Naples law was concerned, the survivor of any such duel would be dealt with as if he were a common murderer and executed. For this reason, Monckton, saint Lô, and their seconds were obliged to keep their duel a profound secret. In order to avoid Neapolitan legislation, they would fight outside the jurisdiction of Naples in a place agreed amongst themselves. In the event, the Count saint Lô shot Stephen Monckton. He died a few minutes later. Mr. Monckton II wrote a brief description of the manner of his death on a piece of paper and pinned the paper to Mr. Monckton's top coat. The body was disposed of and the remaining members of the escapade vanished. Well, it's a hideous and perplexing affair, to be sure. But in view of so much detailed evidence, you amaze me that no trace of your uncle has been found. Uh, presumably because of the facts at your disposal, you have confined your inquiries to the Roman territory. Certainly. The search has been made there and there only. If I can believe the police, they and their agents have inquired for the place where the duel was fought, offering a large reward in my name to the person who can discover it, all along the high road from Naples to Rome. 
If you can believe the police? What else have they done? They've circulated descriptions of the duelists and their seconds and have attempted to trace the whereabouts of the Count saint Lo. But all these efforts, supposing them to have been really made, have so far proved utterly fruitless. This leads me to believe the police take no great interest in the affair. You have something in mind, Mr Fortune? My belief is that the duel was fought somewhere near the Neapolitan frontier. Yes. If I were pursuing the search, I should only have pursued it parallel with the frontier, starting from west to east until I found myself among the, the lonely places in the mountains. That is my notion. Do you think it worth anything? I think it an inspiration. We must begin at once, because the police are certainly not to be trusted with it. I shall start myself. Tomorrow. Uh, uh, one moment, Alfred. What is it? You must forgive me mentioning this in your presence, Miss Elmsley, but there is one very real practicality to be observed. What, man? What? Your uncle has been dead since February the 22nd. It is now late May. However the body was disposed of... I am of, certain it was never buried. That it is, in the words of the legend, graveless under open sky. Then my caveat becomes even more relevant. Forgive me, Miss Elmsley, but the corpse must now be hideously decomposed... If we find it, how shall it be conveyed back to Wincott? Well, that's the least of our problems. The moment I received news of my uncle's death, I had a lead-lined coffin prepared. It's here now. Where? Not five yards away. In my bedroom. Two days later, our preparations made, Alfred and I left Naples before sunrise without a soul in the streets to stare at us. You may imagine that I shrank instinctively from looking forward a single day into the future when I found myself starting in company with Mad Monkton to hunt for the body of a dead duelist. Well, after three days, we reached the small town of Fondi, high in the mountains, and already I was beginning to regret that Alfred had accompanied me. I'm sorry. I shall have to rest for a while. If we're to make any sort of a headway, we must proceed faster, not slower. I'm exhausted. But why? We've only been walking for an hour. I haven't slept. Not for three days. Oh, that's absurd. It's true. The moment I realised we might be within reach of finding my uncle, he's never ceased to make my nights monstrous with his presence. You're overindulging your imagination and it must stop. You're free. You aren't a Moncton tied to that intolerable abbey and its archaic responsibilities. You can have no conception of what I'm going through. I know this much. You have him, Miss Elmsley, a very remarkable, very courageous and very loyal fiancé. And if you believe more strongly in this creature of your imagination than you do in her, then I suggest we abandon this search at once and you may resume your communications with Limbo. But he's here. He's here now. Don't you see him? Where? Alfred, where? I see a mountain track, I see trees, rocks, a multitude of birds and nothing else. Then you are very fortunate. Ah, very well. Let us continue. Refresh my memory. What did the priest say exactly? Your Italian is so much better than mine. Well, as you observed, he seemed terrified when I spoke of a dueling party and a dead man and said he had no idea what I was talking about. When I gave him money for his church... He was prepared to say that there's an old convent up this track that the Father Superior there might just be able to help. Might just be able to help? And that's all? That's all. Well, how far do you estimate we are from the convent now? Uh, I guess. Perhaps a quarter of an hour's walk away. It was an hour before we reached the convent, and a more indescribably sinister place I never wished to see. Moss clustered thick in every crevice of the scowling wall that surrounded it. Lank weeds grew from the fissures of roof and parapet. The very cross opposite the entrance gate, with a terrifying life-size figure in wood nailed to it, was so beset at the base with crawling creatures that I absolutely shrank from it. What an abominable place. Yes, it seems deserted. Who could possibly live in this squalor? Do you think that priest was lying? For money, he'd tell you anything. So what do we do? I don't think I can bear to stay here much longer. Nor can I. 
But since we are here, we must attempt to raise this father superior. If he exists. If he exists. Is that a bell rope up there? Try it. Oh, this is an awful place. I hope your pistol is primed. We may have need of weapons here. You believe we're in danger? Of this place, I believe anything. That smell. What is it? Smell? There is something. Something... Something rank and noisome. Where's it coming from? It's from that outhouse, isn't it? Alfred, come here. What have you found? This stench is sickening. I know, I know. But the outhouse has no roof to it. Look, look give me a leg up, will you? What can you... What can you see? Oh, dear God. It's unbelievable. Piers, get down. Someone's opening the door. What do you want here? Whom are we addressing, sir? My name is Damien. I am the father superior of this convent. Why are you here? We wish to speak to you, father. Are you alone? Quite alone. There are no women with you? We are alone, sir. Then come inside. So, gentlemen, why are you here? It's a long story, Father Damien. Alfred, one moment, please. Sir, to my disgust and horror, I find there is an unburied and rotting corpse in the outhouse attached to this convent. What? And I believe that corpse to be the body of an English gentleman of rank and fortune who was killed in a duel. Beggared of six feet of earth. This gentleman is his nephew. We are here to recover the remains and for that purpose only. Sir, why was the man not given a decent burial? You spoke of the disgust and horror you felt on seeing his corpse. We too felt disgust and horror that a non-believer should dare to fight a duel within the territory of Holy Church. You stand on consecrated ground, sir, and we are not accustomed to bury the violators of our most sacred laws in consecrated ground. That is all the explanation I think it necessary to give. Father, was there a paper pinned to the dead man's coat? There was. Did it explain his identity and the manner of his death? It did. And are you certain that the corpse is indeed that of my uncle, Stephen Monckton, formerly of Wincott Abbey in the county of Shropshire, England? That is the inference I have drawn. Then may we have your permission to remove the corpse? We've made the necessary preparations. You say you are that wretch's nephew. What proof do you have of this? I have papers, both with me and at Fondi, which will establish my relationship beyond all doubt. Then return to Fondi. Satisfy the civil authorities of your claims... And you may remove that, that sacrilegious object from hallowed ground immediately. <laughs> Piers, you've been marvellous. How shall I ever repay you? No brother could have borne with me more affectionately or helped me more patiently than you. Well, I'm relieved to see a happy outcome to our search. And once we're aboard ship, we should be able to relax at last. <laughs> I feel years younger already. Centuries younger. And the spectre? Does it still appear to you? Alfred. Did I not tell you that it followed me everywhere? We shall part, that phantom and I, when the empty place is filled in Wincott Vault. Then I can stand with Ada before the altar in the Abbey Chapel. And when my eyes meet hers... They will see Stephen Monckton's tortured face no more. Within ten days, the necessary formalities had been looked to, and we were ready to find a ship. Ada Elmsley and her mother set off ahead of us. They would meet us at Wincott Abbey. But we had difficulty in finding a suitable vessel. Eventually, we were obliged to charter one ourselves, a Sicilian brig with a job lot of crewmen and an English skipper. Finally, by mid-June, we put to sea, on a calm and lovely afternoon. The captain and crew were in high spirits, and Alfred was happier than I had ever known him to be. I alone felt heavy at heart. There was no valid reason that I could assign to myself for the melancholy that possessed me. Yet I struggled against it in vain. Mr. Fortune! Could I have a word with you, sir? Yes, of course, Captain. What is it? There's something wrong among the men up forehead. 
Did you notice how they all suddenly fell silent just before sunset? Well, now you mention it, I believe I did notice something odd. Yes, well, there's a Maltese lad aboard, smart as a whip, but a handful to deal with. I've discovered he's been telling the men something fairly unpleasant about that packing case your friend keeps locked in his cabin. What has he been saying? Uh, that there's a dead body in that case and not a statue. Oh, what could have given him that ridiculous notion? No idea, sir. He wouldn't say. But I'd advise you to call the crew aft and contradict the boy whether he speaks the truth or not. The men are a pack of superstitious fools and they're getting very restive. We shall have trouble, sir, if you don't do as I suggest. I'm grateful for your concern, Captain Rance, but I have no intention of allowing that young mischief-maker the privilege of hearing me contradict him. And if I may make a suggestion to you, a touch of the rope's end would solve the situation a good deal more satisfactorily. How much longer can she take this kind of beating? It was calm not two hours ago. What kind of freak storm is this? Gentlemen, open the door. Let me in. The men are blaming this on that damn corpse. They're saying it's a Jonah. They intend to quit the ship. But can the brig be saved? No chance. She's broached during the waves of pounding it to pieces. We'll have to leave everything and make for the longboat. We must take the case with us. They'd never let you aboard with it. Now move, gentlemen. Now, before we all drown. Piers. If the brig sinks, the empty place in Wincott Vault will remain empty forever. Forget that gibberish and come up on deck. Now! Come. Let me show you the vault. There's no need, and it can only distress you further. I want you to see it. I, I want you to feel with me the power of that damnable legend. No good will come of this. Would you refuse me? I shall come with you, but with the most extreme reluctance. Your life lies outside these vaults, with Ada. Do you suppose I could marry Ada now? It's out of the question. She does not seem to be of that opinion. Ada has never been down here. I would never allow it. Now, are you coming with me? Very well. Here sleep all the Monktons but two. Myself and Stephen. See that niche? Alfred, for heaven's sake, you're being excessively morbid. Let's get out of this charnel house. If Stephen Monckton's corpse were not lying fathoms beneath the ocean, the coffin would have been placed there. Keep him away from me. What? Keep him away from me. I cannot bear those terrible eyes of his. Look at him. One of his hands, still clutching a pistol, has fallen to his side. The other... Alfred, the stop other it! The other presses a bloody handkerchief to his mouth and he looks at me with those terrible black eyes. He looks at me. Always at me. Always at me. Oh. Oh. Alfred! Alfred! Dwindling ever faster, faster. Dwindling to the last left master. From mortal ken, from light of day, Moncton's race shall pass away. Soul Music on BBC Radio 4 Extra, the series about pieces of music with a powerful emotional impact. My name's Roy Goodman, and I was lucky enough to record the solo treble part in Allegra's Miserere with the Choir of King's College in Cambridge in 1963 for Decca Records when I was 12 years old. I guess we were one of the 
first people to record it, and, and I wasn't aware of that at the time. We used to sing this piece every year on Ash Wednesday, as was the tradition in the Sistine Chapel, where it was sung by the Vatican Choir. And I guess because it had some very high notes for the treble to sing, it was a, a piece that we never forgot. It was a challenge, a big, big challenge. Very often it wasn't even possible just for one boy to sing it, so there'd be two or three boys singing just for security. Um, but I guess that a large part of it, really, of the sort of memory and the, the sort of idea, uh, the, the, the feeling around the piece, was, was the fact that it would be late at night in the chapel, only lit by candles, but the chapel was very dark, and there was just this extraordinary atmosphere. I don't know what it was, even at those, you know, to a tender age of, you know, from eight even, um, you, you get, you know, drawn into this extraordinarily uh, emotional atmosphere, um, something way beyond your, your tender years, and um, it's just an experience you can never forget. I mean, it's wonderful. I was quite keen on sport um, when I was 12, and um, we had a match that afternoon, and um, I know the matron was very worried because the two of us, Michael George, who's a wonderful bass singer these days, um, and I, we were both in the team, and um, the match finished a bit late or something, you know, perhaps we went into a penalty shootout or something very dramatic, and uh, we rushed back to school, muddy knees and all that kind of thing, but we did have long trousers for singing in the chapel, and so we just quickly put on our chapel clothes and rushed in and actually I had no idea we knew we were sort of probably recording this piece but recordings were quite commonplace um, we did a lot of radio recordings and, and a lot of um, LP recordings and um, so I had no idea that, that very soon after that I was going to be Trans transformed into an angel, <laughs> as it were, to sing this solo. And, and I think David Wilcox sort of was just going down a line of boys and trying, trying them out, which is what he often, you know, see who was on form that day. And uh, he simply got down to me and said, yes, yes, that's, that's, that's the one, Roy, if you'd like to join the, 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 the others and just go down towards the, um, the altar. And I, I sang, we had to, it was a bit scary, really, being, it was the, one of the only times I, 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 we had to sing as a separate unit from the main choir. Normally, you know, there were 30 of us or whatever all together with the men, and um, you felt fairly <laughs> safe. But uh, we were actually physically separated um, and uh, so just this small group of whatever five of us um, were halfway down towards the altar and you knew what it was all about. I mean, th there was some extraordinary sense, as I say, even at a very young age, wh when the red light went on for the recording, that um, you had to be something different. It, it, it pushed buttons and triggers and stuff within you. And, you know, it was like impossible to make a mistake, and you actually had to give a brilliant performance. I mean, that was what was expected, and you didn't know anything else, so you just uh, went into that kind of mode and uh, hoped for the best, I guess. I think whenever I hear that piece, I am immediately transported back to that moment in the chapel. I can see it in my mind's eye as if it was, you know, an hour ago. It will stay with me forever, of course, and everything is linked to that. Uh, I